Welcome her to another edition of the Unicorn Chef. I am joined by uh, one of my favorite chefs. Literally, I was over at his house on Saturday, safely distanced, of course, in the COVID era, and commented that it's the one place I know I can go where the food is definitely better than what I make at home every single time. That is my my good friend, Alan Friedman. Welcome. Hey, Bryson. Happy to be here. Um, our uh, We got several special things for tonight. So first of all, this is a special Hanukkah edition. That's why we're doing it on Tuesday. We'll have our regular session tomorrow um, with uh, Donnie, who is going to be calling in all the way from Europe. Um, second, of course, is highlighting uh, our charity, the End Street Village, which is up. So as always, please donate. Alan, uh, what's the story behind this uh, charity? Uh, so End Street Village is our local women's shelter. I live here in downtown DC. Uh, and you guys know it's really a hard time. Uh, there are a lot more folks out on the street uh, and it's particularly hard for uh, women in at-risk populations and End Street Village has just done a fantastic job uh, during all of this. So we wanted to support them as good neighbors. And uh, for those of you who haven't seen, um, for those of you who've been watching the show since I started in March, of course, a lot more hair has found its way here. And this is the final month. So double whammy here. Of course, always let us know whenever you donate. Always let us know whenever you share and cook your own recipe at home. Hashtag Unicorn Chef so we can see that. Um, but in this case, um, check out my Twitter account. And if you, if you donate to this charity or if there's anything you do at the end of the year to help make the world better, put that in there and you get put into the raffle to decide what costume or how I cut this hair off to start off 2021. So a little extra bonus there. Um, some of us have some very fun ideas for this. Yeah, well, I hope you participate. Um, what are you drinking? Uh, I'm having a little bit of sherry tonight. Um, so uh, sherry fortified wine, and it's got a nice balance of richness and booze and a little acid that's gonna stand up to the heat uh, or the fat of the latkes. And uh, it's just, it's a nice way to begin the evening uh, as, a, as an aperitif drink. How about you? What do you, what do you got there? I feel so pedestrian with my Southern Tier Brewing Company, Lakeshore Fog Hazy and Juicy IPA. <laughs> well, cheers. Cheers. And, and uh, happy Hanukkah to you. Happy Hanukkah. Uh, let's, uh, let's go do the Hanukkah blessing and get this started. I like it. So for those who aren't familiar, while, while Bryson has the traveling music, this is a Hanukkah menorah. Actually, to be slightly more precise, this is a bunch of wine bottles because back in grad school, I one year couldn't find a menorah, didn't have a menorah, but did have a whole bunch of empty booze bottles. And so that's begun a tradition that's lasted uh, for many years uh, to have a uh, Hanukkah menorah out of uh, fun things that I've drunk. Uh, and... Uh, I'll be frank, we've done a decent amount of that this year. As have we all. <laughs> and the tradition behind lighting menorahs, again, I think uh, some of you know this, is uh, you get add a new candle every year, every day rather, uh, so until you have eight candles for all eight days. So you start off with just one. It's the sixth night. And uh, you take this one candle, the center candle, the shamash, and uh, you use that to light the other candles as you say the blessing. Bryson? Uh, yeah, no, so um, I had to, I could not find my lighter or matches, so I lit a separate candle instead of my shamash, um, and that's how I'll be doing it. So uh, when we're ready, we'll uh, start with the blessing. Baruch atah adonai. Adonai. Ohinu melechalam. Asher kirshana. Mitzvotam. Hadlik Nair, Shell Hanukkah. Shell Hanukkah. I said Vitsi Bado, that's wrong. Baruch Atarunai, Elohenu Melech Olam, Sha'asa Nisim Lavotenu, Bayomim Hahem, Lazman Hazeh. And that is thanking the divine for creating the commandments and the rituals, including that of Hanukkah, and then for doing second one, thanking the divine for 
Miracles in Days of Old. I feel like they had a lot more miracles back then. Why don't we get more of those? You know, it's, it's, uh, I'll be frank, since the arrival of the camera phone, we've been short on both miracles and UFO visits. <laughs> That's, it's the camera phone that ruined it. <laughs> it is. But it is a fun tradition. Uh, as a, as a child, I certainly uh, spent a lot of time learning about fire. Uh, by playing with the family candles, and um, uh, and you know, fire and light this time of year, cross cultural fun, and uh, nice to have a, a little tradition. So, cheers! Happy Hanukkah! Happy Hanukkah! So, tonight we're gonna make some latkes. Uh, this is uh, one of the most fun treats. Uh, it is, uh, you know, has its origins in sort of the Eastern European tradition, and it's actually very simple. It is uh, just a fried potato pancake, but there are a couple fun tricks that we'll talk about, and it starts off uh, with grating some potatoes. But uh, so I'm going to uh, give you a little little zoom in camera here. Aha! See, this is this is where it's always helpful to have the things pre-done. Uh, if you're making these at scale which most years I do. Last year, we did 25, 30 pounds worth of potatoes. Um, it's totally okay to use a Cuisinart or an automated grater. Um, I think you get a slight benefit by using the hand grater uh, for two reasons. One, because the edges are a little more jagged. You get a little more exposed starch. And two, your Jewish grandmother will say, that that tiny little bit of blood that you get in there, that's love. And that's the secret ingredient. Uh, that was, uh, I think that was Wendy Nather who made that comment that <laughs> the time of year, you see the, the blood that's in there and my yeah. thumbs are completely chewed up from grating. Well, and and I've got the uh, the gloves on uh, is, a, is a mild form of protection, but also uh, because of what we're gonna do as one of, I think the real tricks of lock and making. So, a fried potato, the challenge is uh, they're full of water. And there are a couple of great rules of cooking, which is anytime you want something golden brown and delicious, water is your enemy. And so the trick of frying, of making latkes, is to get as much water out of them as possible. So we'll just uh, show the great butt. So there are a couple of ways that you can do that. Uh, and it's going to be a combination of uh, chemistry and force. So we've taken our potatoes and we're putting them in a strainer. And then we're going to sprinkle on some salt. We're going to toss them with some salt. And the nice thing is we need a lot of salt in latkes anyway because potatoes love good salt. But that's going to start to pull the water out, right? If you ever cook and you salt cucumbers or eggplant or anything like that, you're pulling the water out. So while we finish our grating, that's going to start there. Uh, and that's really going to be key to getting the, the latke out there. Now, the latke is kind of a fun tradition. Uh, someone pointed out recently on Twitter, there's a link from uh, my old friend Aki Peretz, that, uh, you know, it can't be that old a Jewish tradition because the potato didn't really hit the shtetl until well after Columbus uh, went across the Atlantic and the Spanish had, already, had you know, taken care of colonizing South America. So it's not that old, but it's certainly old enough to be a big part of it. I, I would also yeah, oh, go ahead. that the uh, potatoes were probably 17, 1800s. I think so. There was a... Uh, Right, but on the other hand, it certainly didn't. It was long enough that the, you know a bunch of other economies were dependent on the potato, so it, it took over pretty quickly. And of course, then you want a couple onions. So by weight, I use uh, five to two. So uh, the if you're doing onions in the box grater, I recommend doing a little smaller grate, um, and that'll just get the the flavor permeated. Right, the onion, uh, a lot of it's going to sort of dizzle into it. You just really want that flavor in your latke. 
but onions are a little trickier to grate. Um, and my goodness, they just make you think of sad things. This is one. Uh, this is one key element. Uh, as somebody who does a lot of these shows, uh, always do the onions before the show because otherwise, then I'm stuck on camera crying. So uh, a note to Bryson's future guest, which is to ask him the advice of the things that you should do in advance. Uh, no, it's. Uh, Did you read certainly... the I will. I will add these to the speaker notes. <laughs> I've, I, I spend enough time in the kitchen playing with alliums that uh, I, I get used to the smart of onions. And it's, uh, if anything, it's a, a signal of the yummy things that are coming one's way. Uh, speaking of alliums, and maybe they aren't alliums even, uh, you showed me a year and a half ago, it was, uh, it was the heads of something. It was like the long, green, stringy element. I can garlic remember. scape. Yes, good memory. Yeah, scapes, scapes. That was it. it was the, uh, it's the garlic sprout that uh, is a fun treat in uh, late spring, early summer here in the mid-Atlantic where the garlic uh, farmers, to make the, the energy go into the bulb, cut off a bunch of the shoots because otherwise it'll, you know, the energy will go to the leaves. And uh, that scape is sort of a combination between uh, asparagus in texture, but it's got a very sweet, mild onion flavor or mild garlic flavor. And it's lovely to grate or pickle or make pesto out of. There's a lot of fun that you can have with it. Um, have you ever had fiddleheads? I do, I, I love fiddleheads. I have a few friends who forage. Uh, I've There's only one thing that I forage for. Uh, and that is another, we're gonna have a little regional pride right now, apparently, um, the pawpaw. You know what a pawpaw is? Uh, it's a fruit. It is, yeah, it's a, it's a uh, Appalachian fruit uh, that really is unlike most other things you find in the store. It's got sort of a sweet, creamy texture. Uh, and you can only find them, they, they, very few people succeed in domesticating them. So you sort of have to wander out into the woods. And uh, I will have to bring this the next time I see you. I have Papa liqueur. Papa liqueur. Oh, that's fascinating. All right. Is it tasty? And the bottle's half drunk, so you've, you've used it. <laughs> it's mostly drunk. <laughs> oh, wow. Yep. I think there's just there's a lot of fun in, in finding the things that are local and special and regional. Uh, you know, I'll be frank, I've never quite understood what makes a hatch chili so wonderful, but I also understand the value of the folks in New Mexico saying, my God, this is our chilies that we can grow and no one else gets them. So we, we do have some insight. This is one advantage of having uh, a robust audience is that um, we have David. Today I learned that prior to potato latkes, were made with buckwheat or rye, and prior to that, were made with cheese. The cheese is uh, is wonderful, and if uh, there, there's a, a uh, so this is where you take your salted potatoes, by the way, and this is a brute force issue. So you want to start really wring them out as much as possible. And I don't know if you can see just how much water comes out of a potato. Um, there's some shortcuts that you can use. You can make a little pouch out of uh, cheesecloth. And and use that to ring it, but really, oh, you, <laughs> uh, but I've found that uh, just squeezing them by the handful over and over again is uh, is gets me what I need. Yeah. And even then, as you're frying, if you have a large batch, you're going to be uh, you're going to be sort of straining it as you pull it. So I'm going to demonstrate this for the folks at home. How you do this with the cheesecloth is whoa, create a tourniquet. Um, and I actually have a, a, and I think he has that over a strainer. So you want to have this in a separate bowl because for what I do is I want to harvest the potato starch out of this, leave the liquid and I want the, I want the starch back. So I use a separate bowl for that and I just tourniquet it until, and these have already been juiced. So there's still a little bit more and I just keep going until I get that extra liquid out. And then for me with this separate bowl, I let it sit 
So the liquid, of course, stays and the sediment comes to the bottom. And that sediment is the potato starch that I want to harvest because that potato starch, of course, um, is going, yeah, right there. See that that part on the top there in that picture? That potato starch is going to help your latkes adhere. Yep. So you should, so latkes are pretty straightforward, right? You need potatoes, you need onions, you need a bind, two types of binder. So you're going to want a little protein. We use eggs. Uh, you could probably find a way to make it vegan on there. I'm sure there's someone who's got some idea about how to use silken tofu. And then you're going to want some starch to help fill it in. Uh, some people make it with a lot of starch. Some people make it where they actually grind up the potatoes. Um, I think that if you uh, sort of make the potatoes cakes compact enough, you don't need that much. But I use a little extra uh, powdered potato starch. And as Bryson said, yes, you definitely save that water because that starch is going to be much bigger uh, particles. And... Uh, so it's going to be a much better binder because it's going to have longer chains to go full Alton Brown on it. Plus, it's a lot of fun to play with because like a lot of starches in liquid, it's a non-Newtonian solid. And so it just feels really weird to play with because it's very hard, but then it's soft as you poke gently at it. I, I really like Alton Brown. So one of the things that comes up repeatedly in uh, these episodes is the difference between chefs and bakers, right? And chefs, cooks we kind of go by feel and there's not a lot of chemistry to what we do. Although the chemistry is there, we, there are a lot of ways to cheat around it. Baking, you're a chemist. You need to have everything right down to get that reaction. And I really enjoy how Alton Brown brings that science to understanding exactly what's happening. And if you can harness that, you can take your cooking to the next level. I agree. Uh, although I think the, for me, the difference between, uh, Baking and uh, is is right you, the technique you're going to need, and you can always up your game on technique on both baking and cooking. It's the commit. It's the importance of following each step and the inability to innovate later on, or the inability to improvise later on. That I think is the tricky part. So baking for me, I've never quite had the patience of it. And by the way, now I'm just leaning on this and taking that last bit, pressing it out. Your wife is an excellent baker. My my wife is an excellent uh, baker um, because she, I think, has that uh, that ability to sort of focus and commit to following something rather than saying, ah, we'll sort of figure out what we're doing as we go along. Well, I mean, uh, which is certainly my. Uh... <laughs> so I'm going to let the water sit for just a little while longer um, so that the starch comes out. I'm going to put my grated onion in here. So I can, I can jump a little bit ahead as, as you saw, as I was showing at home, I've already juiced everything, let it sit, had my potato starch. You just pour off that water, you left the potato starch, toss everything back together and then. Yep. And uh, so i am decided, I looked at the amount of onion to potato I have and I've decided I want a little more onion. Now you don't have to peel your potatoes. Um, I mean, I think fan of not that. peeling potatoes, just to be frank. What's that? I'm a big fan of not peeling potatoes. So uh, depending, you know, I, I'm not one of these hyper organic people, but I also feel that uh, industrial potatoes, the skin is very thin. So some folks who are concerned about that may sort of care about that. Um, for me, the closest... The closest store is Whole Foods, so I can't buy in inorganic potatoes. I can only pay a lot more for organic potatoes if I am uh, lazy. But, uh, yeah, I think that's really the only reason to sort of focus on peeling your potatoes. You've got a good scrubber. Why not? The uh, okay, We're going to get another onion here. And, of course, the salt. You're going to get some salt from... Uh, the salting of your uh, potatoes um, and the uh, one of the challenges for things like latkes uh, is even if you don't mind eating things with raw egg in them, raw potato just isn't that tasty. Uh, and so it's hard to know in advance as you go how much salt to add because it is uh, potatoes really absorb a lot of salt. In fact, that's um, a trick in your cooking. If you ever put too much salt into something, 
even if it doesn't call for it, throw some potatoes in there and that'll take the salt back out. Oh, that's a good tip. I like that. All right, so I've got my potatoes and uh, onions. So I'm going to uh, add for this much, I'm gonna add maybe, maybe just one egg. We'll see how that goes. You know why, Bryson? Because one egg is enough. Oh, French joke. French dad joke. It's a <laughs> French dad joke, and some of your audience will know that that is actually a plagiarized French dad joke from an old TV show. Um, but it is one that gets repeated mentions in my uh, uh, house. The other running cook joke is, uh, I say, well, you know, to thicken this sauce, I'm going to uh, mix some flour and butter and melt them together. And uh, my wife often asks me whether I will regret that because will I rue it? Yeah, that's... Bryson's just gonna give me five minutes of silent treatment now for that one. I, I love dad jokes. Um, I, am, I am a huge fan of food puns. This, these are uh, the rude one I hadn't heard before. So that one, that, I love that. You just you introduced um, me to the one, I'm game. <laughs> Gonna add a little of my uh, powdered potato starch here. And what I've done is I've just made a little well in my uh, bowl. And so I'm gonna mix, I'm gonna dissolve the starch in the egg before and that'll help it mix in a little better so you don't get clumps. One of those things, you know, similar to uh, those of you who make pasta. That's exactly what you would do as well. Is you make mix your egg and you beat it and then you slowly pull it, gradually pull it in. We're uh, we're actually we're making a beet pasta tomorrow night. A beet pasta. Yes, red beet. As pasta. in like something that's disaffected with 1950s American culture or red uh, red beet pasta. So we're going to be taking beets, um, and similar to this, um, I'm going to be grading mine. She's going to recommend uh, Cuisine Arts, and uh, we're going to be turning that into pasta. That sounds really exciting, uh, and also something I imagine is very similar to latkes in that it's amazing if you can figure out how to get rid of the moisture. Um, I, I don't actually know the answer to that for that tomorrow. Um, when I make butternut squash dumplings, which looks from what I've seen yep. of a recipe to be a similar thing, I never worry about moisture with that. Interesting. So here's my uh, water. You can see there's a nice little layer. I'm going to pour the water off. And just because it's kind of fun to see, look at how much starch is in there. I hope you guys can, oops, actually show it under the camera. You can really get, you know, let me pull it in because it's actually now nice and hard. So we've got a lot of potato starch in there. We're going to fold into our latkes and that's going to help them stay nice and cakey together. Now, a lot of folks are worried about frying at home if you don't fry things a lot. Uh, and it's, it's not that tricky. You just got to commit to it. Um, it is going to make your house smell a little bit. If you've got some ventilation, you'll want to think about that. Uh, and the other thing you want to think about is what you can do with your waste oil. What's that? You'll make it smell good. <laughs> so, you know, what, uh, we, uh, we fried our latkes outside this year with some friends and, uh, and Bryson got to come over for that. And that was lovely. And it's meant that my house hasn't smelled like latkes for the other miracle of Hanukkah is that that smell lasts for eight full days. <laughs> and then the last thing uh, I like to add around now is always good to add a little salt and pepper. And I'll probably add just a little more salt than what I have already. And somewhere I've got a pepper grinder, a little pepper. Um, this is actually one of those rare times where if you have non-fresh ground pepper just sitting around, uh, it'll be good because you, you know, you usually almost always want the, the flavor of fresh ground pepper, uh, but this you want to be a background note, so you don't want that punch of fresh ground pepper. 
So once you've got your mitts, you want to set up for frying. And the setup, you're going to want uh, you know, to be prepared. And so you want a few things. Uh, and you want to set up a little convenience line. So you get your batter. And you want to figure out where they're going to go. And as they come out, a plate or a tray with some paper towels to help them drain. We put our oil in the pan. And uh, I like to do maybe a finger's worth. You probably can shallow fry them a little more. But uh, I think there's, there's some value in having a little of the oil splash over the top. And so uh, we've got about a, about a small finger's width of depth in there. And we're aiming for about 350, 340. It'll take you just a little while to dial it in on your stove. I always forget every year uh, on my uh, induction stove what level works because uh, different pans, it's going to work differently. And uh, and then you're going to want to figure out what your tools are. So you can't go wrong with some tongs, but it's often good to have uh, a little spatula of some kind as well. Let's see if I can find one that I use. something like this to flip it. Now, we were commenting, someone online was bragging about using schmaltz to fry things. Uh, you don't go wrong with schmaltz uh, in Jewish cooking. Uh, at one point, many, many years ago, I made uh, chopped liver for the first time. And I gave some to my then 90-year-old grandfather and I was very excited. My grandfather has always appreciated Right, like all grandparents, you know, very enthusiastic. Uh, this one, he took a taste and didn't immediately smile, which is weird, not because I'm a great cook, but because he's a grandfather. And I said, he said does it mean something? And he just said, needs schmaltz. My grandfather grew up in Brooklyn and, you know, chopped liver isn't the same without schmaltz. So if, you, if you've got some chicken fat, you can fry it. The challenge with frying chicken fat is it doesn't last for many, many batches. It sort of degrades over time. So a trick that I use um, is uh, I don't, I mean, schmaltz is typically something you're gonna have to go and get uh, at a store and it's hard. Any oil does work, right? Um, one of the things that I like is my, my favorite fall and winter dish is a very special concocted grilled cheese with butternut squash soup. And part mm. of my special is I make tempura. And with regular oil, I can reuse that temp, I can reuse, I can keep the oil. And so the oil that I kept, um, I actually have, I keep a container of it. In fact, you can see like the stuff there, right? So it's got, yeah. the oil has a ton of flavor that picks up with it. And so I kind of can get away with uh, using a substandard oil because there's so much else going on with it. Oh, I like that. That's a fun idea. And, you know, it lasts for longer than expected. Yep. <laughs> now, uh, fun fact about that, for, for those of you who don't know much about, about Hanukkah, is, uh, right, first, Hanukkah, despite being very popular in pop culture, is a very minor Jewish holiday. Uh, in, in the liturgy, it is, it is seen as, as a, not even, it's not even mentioned in what is accepted as, as the Bible um, in the Jewish tradition. But, and the, the core of it is, is a, a warrior victory. Uh, it was, it's the story of how uh, the Israelites at the time overthrew the bad guys who were trying to uh, uh, keep them down, as many holidays in the United States are. Uh, now, growing up, I was always confused because half the books, half the children's stories that I read said the bad guys were Greeks, half of them said they were Syrians. And I was very confused by that uh, until I finally learned a little history uh, about how after Alexander the Great's empire fell apart into different smaller regional empires, they were Hellenistic. They were Greek in culture, but they were, uh, they were it was the Syrian part of that uh, empire. So today we often hear about the miracle of the oil. Uh, and, uh, and that is indeed part of the Jewish tradition, but it's a much later part of the tradition. 
uh, and where the, the story is after these heroes had thrown off the foreign uh, oppressors, they came and said, uh, went to rededicate the temple. And part of dedicating the temple was having the holy light, uh, the holy lamp. And it was only enough oil for one day, but it lasted eight days until they get the new one. So that is sort of this tradition that comes from uh, the writings of the rabbis from over a thousand years ago, but it wasn't part of the original story. And the uh, we're gonna fry our test latke. So the nice thing about frying test latkes is you can usually find someone in your home who uh, is gonna help you eat it and make a decision because everyone gets excited about the first few latkes and the second few latkes and so on. Uh, but as you go, so you can start to see, even though we've wrung out all of our water, there's still a lot of liquid in here. Let me try not to spill this all over my camera here. Um, so the other important thing is as you go, you want to take a pinch full of the dough and wring it out. So you're still, the downside of the mirroring is still haven't gotten used to that. So you're still getting a lot of moisture out. So now you've got a lump like this. You want to make it into a ball like so. And then we squeeze it flat. You've got a nice disc like this. And we slide it gently into our oil. And let's see if we can good enough view. And it turns out since it's not sizzling, my oil is not hot enough. So I'm going to turn it up a little bit. So you should get start to get a little bit of as soon as it slides in, there should be sizzling uh, around the edge. Uh, you don't want it to brown too fast, but you certainly want it to be uh, well above the boiling point of water. So, uh, Alan, I, I don't think we can ever have you on the air without asking an S-bomb question. <laughs> Uh, so, and the, the irony is this is about as simple as a recipe as it gets. Uh, so most of the time when you're talking about SBOM, we talk about the complexities of uh, needing to know what the ingredients are. I suppose there are people who uh, are, and this recipe is gluten-free, but there are people who don't eat eggs. And so you'd still want to know that. But some of you are saying, wait, I've never met Alan before, so I don't know what an SBOM is. The rest of you who know me are saying, Dear God, he's on about SBOM again. Uh, so an SBOM is a software bill of materials. And this is a fun little initiative that we're leading at uh, NTIA in the US Department of Commerce. Wait, did you just say it's a government initiative that's fun? Uh, well, I have fun doing it. And, uh, and I'm pretty lucky to be helped by a bunch of fun experts, including, uh, you know, this guy here. Uh, so. One way to think about it is it's a list of ingredients cooking for software, right? If you go to the store and you buy a piece of candy or you buy a Twinkie, it comes with... <laughs> He's not in <a> bomb. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Elisa. If you go to the store and you buy a Twinkie, it's going to come with a list of ingredients. And by the way, fun fact, Twinkies, uh, as uh, Ali taught me, uh, are not actually vegetarian. They have beef fat in them. Sometimes it says tallow on it, which is even worse because not everyone knows what tallow is. Uh, but the uh, maybe you don't care, right? I eat Twinkies because I like a good biodegradable snack. But the challenge is, uh, you know, helping people make the appropriate decision. And so in this case, you want to have a list of ingredients so that folks can say what they're a fan of and what they're not. In software, it's a little more complicated, but the basic concept is the same, which is you didn't write all of your software from scratch. You probably used other components. And some of that's great, but some of that is eventually gonna be outdated. It's gonna have vulnerabilities in it. Uh, it's gonna have risks. And we want transparency to help make that kind of risk. This isn't a super easy problem. Uh, we've been having some fun because for example, while when I say potato and you say potato, we have a rough idea of what we're saying. Uh, if we're trying to build a global database of ingredients, it's going to be a little trickier. And the same is true for software, right? The computer says potato. 
it needs to be very precise about what kind of potato. Uh, and similarly, right, use com.sum.java or com.oracle.java. We have a naming problem or an identity problem in software. But the uh, what I love is over the last two years, we've managed to pull together experts from across the software world, across the vulnerability world, across the security world, but also the people who make and use software in healthcare, in finance, in, uh, in, in the car industry. We're just starting some work in the energy world and in, in bulk power to say, hey, let's get the folks who make the equipment and the folks who use the equipment and have them talk about how to share information about their supply chain. And so if anyone is interested in thinking about underlying dependencies or open source risks or software supply chain or vulnerability management, uh, look on Twitter for hashtag SBOM, reach out to me. Uh, there's a lot of great work happening and I'll be honest, it's a fun community. Uh, recently, a bunch of the folks who've been involved in running it are trying to come up with the, the 12 days of SBOM to, uh, to sort of help us get through the holidays since we're gonna be taking some time off from this effort. Now, I am noticing that my oil's still a little low, so I'm going to turn it up. This is the downside. Someday, Bryson, I will meet the person who decided to build a conductive panel on a stove. And that person and I will have words. <laughs> because you got to cook with fire, man. You just can't feel it otherwise. You know, I live, I live downtown. We're not fit for gas. So I have an induction. Cooktop. I disagree. You have all of those politicians. There's lots of. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's funny because DC is horrible, uh, <laughs> but it's a great drinking town. I'll say that much. Uh, and it is, and it is, Really, there, there's a wonderful community of people who live in D.C. The vast majority of people that we hang out with aren't part of the sort of Beltway racket. And uh, and that's kind of nice that it's got a fun fun little community down here. Yeah, I always like that when people are like, well, how do you live there and deal with all them? Like, you don't understand. Like, I don't participate in that. Like, that's not my daily life. We don't talk about politics. Whatever you're reading in the post, we're not, we're not doing that. Oh, yeah. No, and in fact, uh, during... Particularly stressful times, we uh, occasionally build a um, write a policy, which is the first person to mention uh, ongoing politics has to pay the forfeit or pick up the tab or what have you. It's uh, it's useful, but it's also nice to you know find the friend with the insider knowledge and get this skinny. It, you know, does help you feel a little more informed. Uh, so, All right. for the audience, what is the schmaltz of the software world? <laughs> uh, oh. That's uh, Schmaltz's marketing language, right? So from sh Schmaltz is rich and you get excited about it, but at the end of the day, it doesn't make you feel great to have too much of it. So it's answered, Schmaltz entered, uh, is it the Yiddish term? Uh, probably from German as well. Entered uh, American English to, through you know, Broadway and, and New York culture. So something that's schmaltzy is glitzy but hollow and fake uh so it's you know really bad christmas feel good movies or schmaltzy uh you think you're gonna like it then at the end you're like Ugh. and so i think uh for us it's definitely uh the marketing world um you know it's been funny to see just how many how
There we go. Can you hear me? All right, we're back. <laughs> this is what happens when you think something is plugged in, but your nice little Apple brick, it's sort of fallen out just a little bit. And so you have to run a, we're trying to stream on battery power. But the good news is while that happened, we have our golden brown and delicious latke. I like a nice little crust on the outside, but not completely dark. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to do our quick, quick test to see how tasty it looks. So you can see in the center, you've got nice golden cooked potatoes. It's not charred all the way through, but you've got a nice uh, outside crust. And this is really just testing for flavor. So you want to make sure it's got enough salt. See if the pepper is good. An emergency, we might have to add some more onion. There's a good amount of onion. I'm going to add just a little more salt to that. Uh, you know, as I can point out, easy to add a little. You can always add more potato to cover the salt. Oh, and boom. You can see my dog under here who's very excited about all the things that I'm dropping. So, let's take our salt. Let me pull this in. Right, so do you have an opinion on the schmaltz of the InfoSec world? What's that? Do you have an opinion on the schmaltz of the InfoSec world? I think I got cut off during my anti my anti marketers rant, which I know is the most oh, original. I mean, I mean, I think you did a great job. We were talking about something being schmaltzy, which of course is again a, another example of uh, uh, Yiddish finding its way into uh, American English. Um, and uh, I mean. Uh, I, I would say schmaltz is any time we're throwing around blockchain and artificial intelligence into solving real world problems. It's not that each of those you know technologies or approaches don't have something of value. They are not the silver bullet marketing schmaltz that is applied across. Yeah. I like it. How's that? How'd I do? I, I no, I think that's uh, as always. When I took a long time to say something, you said it much more distinctly, but every bit is clear and valuable. Someday I'll learn the secret to brevity. No, oh, it's it's simple. I'm dumber than you are. <laughs> Not true. Not true. I just spent more time trying to teach myself to use big words for some reason. I was a spelling bee champion, my friend. I I enjoy large words very much. <laughs> Do you, uh, so I have a friend who tries to make book on the, uh, the annual spelling bee, which is apparently frowned on. Do you, do you watch the spelling bee? Do you enjoy that? I, uh, I do not watch it. I pretty much don't watch much of anything. <laughs> oh, see, now we get a little too much bubbling going on, and so uh, I'm going to turn the heat down. This is just one of those things that, again, speaks to... Yeah, you want that feedback, right? You want to pay attention to what's going on, and if something is getting too crisp too fast, right? So the lock is crisp up too fast, it won't, uh, uh, the inside won't get nice and soft and uh, creamy, but if it takes too long, the outside's going to get tough, right? All that starch will for start to form a little too much of a bond. Yeah, no, the right temperature to the oil really is a big trick to this. And there's no, there really is no way to like prescribe that, right? Yeah. Everything stove, whatever, whatever you're using to cook it in. I use a cast iron because I really like holding the heat. Um, this is part of why I don't like induction stoves. You just can't, you can't ever learn it really well because induction doesn't sort of give you that. Um, I think, I mean, uh, I will defend induction, uh, right? A, a, a truly amazing gas stove is magical, uh, but uh, induction, I like, um, it, it, I think it actually is quite good at 
nailing the heat level because once you dial it in, it is it is very specific because the heat is coming from a very specific place. Um, but are you is, is induction the PhD of uh, stoves? Is that what? <laughs> that's what you're doing? Is that what you're doing? Uh, slightly more useful than a PhD. Uh, plus, it's okay for a woman to have uh, an induction cooktop. And apparently, according to the Wall Street Journal uh, editorial page, there's some concern about whether or not it's okay. But we don't need to get into that. Well, I believe technically that was an editorial, right, by uh, yet another of this year's wonders, uh, Mr. Epstein. Uh, you know, it's getting to be that my friends with Epstein and his last name are starting to worry. So, yeah, once you've got your uh, oil temperature dialed in, then it's time to sort of just start making this in a, a process. Uh, so there are two approaches to frying latkes. One is in series and the other is in parallel. So one is you can put a new one in every minute and then you'll be taking one out every minute. You've got a nice even flow. And that's good because it gives you a thing to do uh, and helps you sort of pay attention as you go. The other approach is you do it in parallel. You put in a bunch at the same time, which is tricky because you can't get distracted during that because you've got to pay attention to the time and make sure they all cook evenly. And if you look away or say you're having the middle of it, you're having a big party and someone comes and hands you a drink, if you turn back a minute too late, you've just, uh, you know, done some, uh, done some damage to that batch of latkes. Now, right, so we haven't talked latke toppings. Are you a, uh, are you a sour cream guy or an applesauce guy? Both. Cheers to that. Why choose? Um, in fact, uh, uh, for this one, I am going to go completely non-traditional. We are going to have um, latke hamburgers. Um, I did a whisk and burby, burby, whisk and bourbon barbecue, um, uh, slow roasted uh, shredded chicken, um, which, uh, so I'm gonna do the, the hamburgers with uh, sliced Gouda. Um, I'm gonna do the chicken, um, just plain, because I didn't have time to throw together my, my slaw with cabbage. And then I'm also going to do um, smoked salmon with uh, fresh dill and sour cream. That is lovely. And smoked salmon on the latke is wonderful. Um, and uh, I'll be honest, the only thing better than smoked salmon on a latke is sour cream and caviar, which uh, the very rich kids growing up in Pittsburgh uh, occasionally, that would be uh, one of the things they'd serve at a, at a bar mitzvah, is you put just a little dollop of caviar. I, d I don't have any caviar. <laughs> so uh, last night I had some fun. I had some some leftover latkes from, from the weekend. Uh, people express the uh, shock of having leftover latkes, but once you're used to making latkes for a crowd, you're just sort of always going to want to make more. And so I made a, uh, I made latke rubens. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. Put a little uh, Russian dressing, some uh, uh, coleslaw if you have it, some sauerkraut, and uh, if you believe in a trafe ruben, a little cheese on top. So I'm and, uh, hamburgers, so I'm trafe. <laughs> uh, for you at home, trafe is just uh, if you're not kosher. So kosher, of course, mixing. Uh, Milk and meat is uh, not kosher. And I, uh, my approach to tradition is uh, to study it carefully and then to ignore it advisedly. Uh, so definitely uh, have a, for, for me, a July 4th tradition is taking a Hebrew national kosher hot dog and wrapping it in bacon, uh, right? It's, it's sort of embracing where you come from, but also that American tradition of... Uh, blatantly insulting your heritage <laughs> never been a fan of the hebrew nationals you and i were talking about this on saturday i just uh i mean speaking of crepe, i like a pork hot dog you like a pork hot dog yeah beef hot dogs just don't have that same like juicy meaty like really good like sausage i uh and i guess i'm i'm just sort of anchored on the uh that all beef style 
And then, you know, if you want the porkiness, you add it later. But, uh, yeah, once you, once you open yourself up to frying, you can do lots of other fun, delicious things. As Bryson said, you can save your oil. Um, for latkes, you definitely want to filter it uh, or, or at least carefully strain it because as you fry, uh, those little bits that come off will slowly char. And that's what degrades your oil is particulate that is not just the pure lipids. Uh, that's going to be the thing that breaks down the oil and makes it uh, more likely to taste off. So I think we're, we're about getting to that point where we're going to be plating here and showing. I can do that. Give me a, just a moment to get a little more brown on this, this first round. Performative lock gang. Like live streamed even. What will they say back home? I know. What will they? What will they say back home? <laughs> the uh, I, I I think uh, those who I've had the privilege of cooking with have uh, noted that in general I always want to just explain to everyone what I'm doing as I cook anyway. Uh, right, you know, growing up on. Julia Child and Alton Brown and uh, Graham, what's his name? The guy who used to be cool until he went vegetarian and stopped drinking. Um, <laughs> Who's that? The I think it was the vegetarianism that made him less interesting as a cook. The uh, but anyway, like right, narrating what you do and having a way of trying to entertain around you because it is a wonderful way of uh, if you if you like cooking. And for me, it's always been something that was never right. You just read some directions, and then if you like to eat, you'll figure out how to make things that you like to eat. That is uh, that's how I learned to cook. And um, but it's it's a wonderful way to uh, to share with things. And actually, it's been one of the hard things for me over the last uh, few months, nine months now is uh, not being able to share that with people. So I've been doing, posting a lot of pictures online of the food I make, not because, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people who lives online, but, uh, but because it's, it's the close thing, the closest way I can share. And hopefully when the world comes back to normal, I'll have more and more new friends who want to come over and uh, spend time at our table. I look forward to that, that that day where we can all do this easily again. So I do have I have a little homemade applesauce, and uh, it's one of those things that um, if you uh, if you have just a few more minutes, the homemade is is magical. Uh, there's a pretty good guide on the serious eats, but it's really simple. It's just chop apples. You can leave the skin on. Use a blend of whatever you have handy, and uh, um, cook it with a little vinegar and a little sugar, and uh, and then take a uh, immersion blender and blend it up, and it's wonderful. So I will uh, show the uh, the fun here. We've got our, our applesauce and sour cream. I got to set up for our, our final picture. Oh, okay. You're ahead of me. All oh, right. Well, sorry, I saw you taking a picture, so I was. Oh yeah, no, I was. I, that's for the gram. Time, and I was, uh, I was getting my plate ready. So this is this is my plate. Well, that's spectacular. That looks amazing, Bryson. So um, this is the the shredded chicken I was talking about, hamburger, and then um, latke with smoked salmon, uh, fresh dill, and uh, sour cream. Nice. Oh, that looks amazing. Yeah. Uh, no, dill, smoked salmon, potatoes, sour cream. That's a pretty spectacular traditional combination. And I love the, I love the, the barbecue too. Thank you. So let's get our picture in. <laughs> Let me uh, try to get, ah, there you we go. You actually have it. There you go. Boom. <laughs> um, so, Alan, thank you for joining us on 
Unicorn Chef, for those of you at home, please hashtag Unicorn Chef, share your stuff. Double whammy, of course, donate to the End Street Village. We'll throw that charity up real quick yet again. Um, and again, uh, if you throw that in off of on my Twitter, if you'll check out, I've got a submission for anybody who donates to that charity or is doing any volunteer work, charity work, anything at all to help those in need at the end of this year. Uh, you get the opportunity to decide what I do with all of this ridiculous hair and costume or anything else to close out the year. That sounds fantastic. Hey, Bryson, I hope you have uh, some wonderful holidays. I hope you find a way to uh, still make them special in spite of the world we're living in. And uh, next year is going to be pretty amazing when it comes to holiday parties. I look forward to it. Good to see you again, man. Good to see you. Thanks, everyone.